Bibliophiles of the internet. My name's Adriana and today I'm here to share with you my September wrap-up. So at the end of August I committed to reading pretty much nothing but Ohm Voices Hispanic books for all of September and October. You will see some of those choices from that TBR sampler video in this wrap-up today and others will most likely end up in my October wrap-up. The first book I read in September was Signal to Noise by Silvia Moreno Garcia. I actually just uploaded a brief spoiler-free review for this book which I will link in the cards and down below because I happen to be pretty proud of it and I think you should check it out. Like I said in that video, this book quickly became one of my new all-time favorites, the unique magic, the Mexican representation, the 80s vibes, the all-consuming nature of the characters and their actions. Everything worked for me and I gave this book five stars. After that I read When the Moon Was Ours by Anna Marie McLemore. This is Own Voices queer Latinx fiction. I quickly realized it was a loose retelling of La Llorona with magical realism. It's about this mysterious girl named Miel who was poured out of a water tower and all her life roses have been growing out of her wrists. She falls in love with a trans boy named Sam who paints the moon over and over and he hangs these moons all over town because they have slight healing powers and a calming effect. There's also four sisters, the Bonner sisters, who everyone believes to be witches and they for whatever reason seem to think that Miel's roses can cause anybody to fall in love so they decide to try and take them from her by force. Not only is this story beautifully written but there's a running theme of discovering wholeness. As humans, we try to compartmentalize things about ourselves, things we mistake as separate or reactionary when in fact all those pieces in conversation with each other make us complete. You see this with Miel's roses, how everyone, including Miel, sees them as a thing her body produces, a thing to be commodified or feared when in fact it's an extension of her existence that can't simply be taken away. You also see this with Sam, how he thinks the clothes he wears and the way he presents himself are just a temporary shield, a way of hiding himself until he's ready to be normal when really it's a validation of his existence that he can't yet put into words. We can't be reduced to any one part because to do so would be to ignore the complexity of humanity and that kind of willful ignorance is the source of a lot of pain and conflict in this story and what I think is really interesting is that it's often self-inflicted for many of these characters. There's also this image of a glass coffin that crops up throughout the story which suggests the idea of literally and metaphorically fitting yourself into a box and it's not until the characters take ownership of their agency that they can finally shatter this pretense. This was an emotionally and visually evocative story. I loved it and I gave it four stars. After that I read The Epic Fail of Arturo Zamora by Pablo Cartaya. This is Ohm Voices Hispanic Middle Grade. It's about Arturo Zamora who spends his summers working part-time in the family restaurant which is owned and run by his abuela. But this summer the restaurant is being threatened by plans to build a huge commercial building in its place and suddenly the continued existence of this community foothold and the Zamora family's livelihood depends on the city council's vote. This is, in truth, a story of resilience. It's about a singular kind of strength that so many Latino and Hispanic families are built upon in my experience. You either have the strength to outright resist anyone who seeks to oppress you or you have strength in knowing that you can rebuild anything that has been lost. For many of us I think it's that kind of history that paves the way for our lives. In fact it's something that a lot of Hispanic and Latino communities are dealing with at this very moment. In this story Arturo learns that change is inevitable. We are always in the middle of change. You can fight it, fear it, or you can be a part of it. I also really love the incorporation of Spanish language in this story. It feels very organic and familiar. It's used in a very smart way to emphasize and reinforce family dynamics. And the translation is subtle and cleverly done. It's not word for word and it's not this private aside between Arturo and the audience. Instead, Arturo contextualizes the Spanish portions by embedding the questions in his answers or his thought process bridges the gap and provides context. It's really natural. It's not just like a line of dialogue and then an italicized sentence that was copied and pasted from Google. It really and truly mimics the way bilingual people process language and it shows you how code switching works. The story also incorporates poetry, specifically from one of the most famous Hispanic poets, Jose Martí, and I thought it was really cool that his poems were allowed to exist in their original state in Spanish on the page, which was very special and for me had a tremendous impact. 
On page 176, Arturo says, family is the only home worth claiming, and I think there is no better line to sum up this book. It was amazing, it was everything I needed it to be, and I gave it four stars. Penultimately, I read The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros. This is one of the original classic own voices Hispanic stories. It's about this young girl named Esperanza Cordero whose family moves into an old house on Mango Street. The story is told through a series of vignettes as Esperanza grows up in this largely Hispanic neighborhood, taking cues from her friends and family about how to understand this small piece of the world and her place in it. This story is incredibly short, just over a hundred pages, but it packs a powerful punch. The story's brevity gives it focus and depth. All these glimpses into Esperanza's life bring forth a very clear picture of desire and a longing for freedom. We begin to see this divide as Esperanza talks about wanting to be as strong and resilient as the trees, which would mean putting down roots and drawing strength from her place. But at the same time, she wants more, so much more, than Mango Street. She sees her neighbors and friends chasing after boys, making sacrifices to find work, gradually losing parts of themselves just so they can call this home permanent. Esperanza, on the other hand, resists falling in line and doing what's expected of her for as long as she can, if only so she can maintain her personhood for when she eventually leaves this place and makes sure that her parents' sacrifices have made a difference. I thought this was a quietly beautiful coming-of-age narrative that remarkably blends elements of prose and poetry, and I understand why it's lasted as a classic. I gave this one four and a half stars. And the last thing I read in September was my poetry collection, which was Beast Girl and Other Origin Myths by Elizabeth Acevedo. This teeny tiny collection takes a lot of inspiration from Latinx myth, folklore, and superstitions, and definitely draws from Acevedo's Dominican roots. I think the best way I can describe this is as a blend of realism and fantastical elements, and the two come into conversation with each other in really fascinating ways. I think my favorite thing about this collection is that as a whole, it posits girls as mythical creatures who are molded and born from the fires of their oppression, submission, and internalization of microaggressive experiences. Women, girls, feminine people are only allowed to exist within the cage of certain expectations, and the second they start living outside of those expectations, they become wholly different creatures, so to speak. Like I said, this collection easily blends realism and folklore. Sometimes they're interwoven, sometimes they're completely separate, but either way, Elizabeth S. Savedo has exactly the right words at exactly the right time, and I gave this collection five stars. Also, really quickly, I do want to mention that at the end of September, I did start The Gods of Tango by Carolina de Robertes, but the thing is, I didn't finish it until, like, last week. I will be talking about this one in my October wrap-up, but I just want to say it is exquisitely written, extremely sensual, deliciously queer. I'm actually thinking about maybe doing an individual spoiler-free review for this one, so in the comments below, let me know if you would like to see that. I mean, I'll most likely still be doing it anyways, no matter what you say, but I would love to know. So those are all the books I read in the month month of September. If you have read or want to read any of the books I mentioned in this video, sound off in the comments below because I would love to know your thoughts. But that is everything I had for this wrap-up today. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope that you enjoyed it and I will catch you on the flip side of the page. Bye!